fellow American Battlefield Trust uh, members, supporters, and viewers. Uh, we are continuing our video series where we are covering elements of the Overland Campaign. We started at Mount Carmel Church. We moved down to the, some of the little known actions at North Anna. And now we're still not to Cold Harbor. In fact, there's a couple of actions that are going to take place between the end of North Anna around May 26th and the beginning of Cold Harbor around June 1st. We're at the first of those called Haw's Shop. There's going to be another one right nearby here um, called Totopotomy Creek. Um, so here we are at Haw's Shop. We're talking about a cavalry action, almost entirely, if not entirely, cavalry action. So you've got Union troopers, Confederate troopers. I'm looking forward to Bobby Crick, uh, NPS historian at the Richmond National Battlefield Park. Uh, his opinion on Phil Sheridan. Of course, the Union's got this new commander. He's going out. I'm looking forward to seeing how he comes down on Sheridan because you come down one way or another on him. There's not a lot of gray area. So Bobby, come on, tell us about Haw's Shop, a very cool little park, at least for now. Well, uh, when we last uh, did some filming, it was at North Anna at the Fox House, and we just kind of left things hanging there um, without a conclusion. Uh, Lee's inverted V, uh, his position at North Anna was enough of a block, enough of a caution to grant that there was no further fighting. Uh, obviously, there's you know some, some skirmishing, May the 24th at Oxford, a little more than a skirmish, and then the 24th at the Doswell House at North Anna. But then the 25th and the 26th, the armies just stood around staring at each other at an impasse. Lee confined to his tent and his cot with a dysentery uh, and Grant scheming how to disengage, retain the initiative that he already had when he came to North Anna and apply new pressure in a different area against the Confederate Army. And to do that, he needed to maneuver. And so on the night of the 26th and the morning of the 27th, Grant disengaged his army from North Anna, crossed everybody to the north bank of that river and marched east rapidly. One of the worst marches of the war for the foot soldiers of the Army of the Potomac. But the big difference between this one and some of the other ones from earlier in the Overland Campaign is that Grant had his cavalry with him on May 26 and May 27 and May 28. Phil Sheridan's cavalry corps had returned from its raid on the 24th, rested for a day and a half, two days, and then set out to screen the advance as the army marched eastward into territory that had not seen the tramping feet of Civil War soldiers prior to May of 1864, out into King William County. Grant was making for the crossings of the Pamunkey River. Remember, the North Anna and the South Anna Rivers come together to form the Pamunkey, and rather than try and fight his way across the North Anna and the South Anna, much easier to just cross the one big river, the Pamunkey, and his cavalry would secure the fords and the crossing spots and then his engineers could lay pontoon bridges. So he spent the 27th and the 28th making that march. His cavalry under Phil Sheridan, 1st Division, 2nd Division primarily, screened the march, secured the crossings, drove off Confederate defenders at Hanover Town, which was one of the crossings, and at Nelson's Ferry, which was the other. And on May the 28th and 29th, Union infantry crossed uh, two corps at each of those two locations. Phil Sheridan's cavalry, having done that duty very admirably, pushed forward to try and gather intelligence about what the Confederates were doing in response to Grant's sideways movement. Grant had marched east and then south and then southwest to get across the Pamunkey. Lee, once he realized that Grant had left the North Anna, could simply go straight south. He had the interior lines of march, but he had lost the initiative. He was backpedaling and he was dancing to someone else's tune he didn't like it, but he had very few alternatives. The next defensible position he chose was Totopotomy Creek. Now to orient you to where you are on the camera, Totopotomy Creek is probably three miles behind you. Lee established the center portion of his defenses at a place called Atlee Station on the Virginia Central Railroad. And immediately to the right of the camera is a historic road. You've heard cars whizzing past while I've been talking. That's what's called the Atlee Station Road during the Civil War Modern Route 606. Over my shoulder to the east would be the crossings of the Pamunkey River. The Union Army had been marching to the left of the camera, parallel to your line of sight before dropping down across the Pamunkey and then pivoting and turning west to face Richmond, which is to the right rear of the camera, but also specifically the Confederate position at Totopotomy Creek. That long, laborious explanation brings us to why there was a battle at Hawes Shop at all on May the 28th. 
Now Hawes shop was a machine shop, not a blacksmith shop, but a more sophisticated undertaking, very prominent in Hanover County in the 1850s and up to the beginning of the Civil War. It was about a mile over my shoulder at a historic intersection, today called Studley, but during 1864 still known as Hawes Shop. And what you're looking out across at is the Haw family farm and the Haw house called Oak Grove, pretty far away. There are three buildings that are prominent there on the horizon, uh, a barn on the left, a large outbuilding in the middle, and the one on the right that's obscured a little bit by trees is the historic original home of John Haw and his family known as Oak Grove. And so that's where they lived and their machine shop was just beyond it. On May the 28th, Grant and Meade wanted some intelligence, some professional intelligence about what response the Confederates were mustering to Grant's movement into Hanover County. Where was Lee? Where had he concentrated his army? Was he defending Totopotomy Creek? Had he pulled in his horns for the defenses of Richmond? Seemed unlikely, but it was possible. And conversely, Lee wanted exactly the same thing from his own horsemen. Jeb Stewart was gone by this time, dead from his wounds at Yellow Tavern, and so Wade Hampton and Fitzhugh Lee were sort of co-leaders of the Confederate Cavalry Force at this point. And on the morning of the 28th, Lee sent those horsemen east on the Atlee Station Road toward Grant and toward the Pamunkey. And that same morning, Grant sent his cavalry under Sheridan, specifically the 2nd Division under David McMurtry Gregg, west from the Pamunkey. So the two competing forces had the same assignment, and they happened to collide in this vicinity on terrain that looks to be ideal for cavalry. Pretty easy to picture men galloping back and forth swinging sabers at each other out here. But this was 1864, and when we talk about Haw's Shop, we often use it as an example of how cavalry warfare was evolving during the Overland Campaign. There's no question that the horses were still important. There were still some mounted battles and skirmishes. Reconnaissance and intelligence gathering was huge, but horses more and more were transportation to get horsemen to the battlefield, and when they got there, they climbed off and fought like infantrymen. And there's no better example than right here at Hawes Shop, which you have one of the largest all cavalry battles of the Civil War any, anywhere in Virginia. Lasted for seven hours, produced almost 700 men killed and wounded, a veritable apocalypse by cavalry standards. And all of that happened right around us here, but it all happened on foot, fighting dismounted. The horses were just convenient transportation. The Union participants, until the very end, all came from David McMurtry Gregg's 2nd Division, which formed up around the Haw House in the distance and advanced on foot across this field toward us and across a, an adjacent field, which is now covered with woods, on the other side of the Atlee Station Road. The Confederates dismounted and established a position immediately behind Enon Church. Now, Enon Church is right behind the you all, right behind the camera, the rebuilt Enon Church in its original location. It's the biggest landmark on the battlefield, a beautiful setting in a little grove of woods, and the Confederates built up their line of battle in those woods immediately behind the church. And today, standing here or looking out a lens like you all are, you would think that the Confederate line of battle would have been positioned right here where we're standing, at the edge of some trees with a perfect panoramic view across a flat field of fire. But for some reason the Confederates didn't do that. They chose to not defend the edge of the field but to defend the woods about a hundred yards behind the camera. And it was only about 20 years ago that historians figured this out. Everyone always sort of just presumed, based on feeble research I guess, that the Confederate line of battle was right here and all the fighting was here and in the field because it makes the most sense topographically. Uh, Gordon Ray, I think, probably the first person to figure out for certain that the Confederate line was back in the trees. The battle did not have a whole lot of drama, a whole lot of pinch points, turning points that you could suggest um, altered the course of the battle. It was a brutal stand-up fight, just like they were infantrymen. The example I often use comes from the 1st Pennsylvania Cavalry, veterans of many a big battlefield, fighting dismounted here. They had about 200 men in the battle, and those 200 men shot off about 90 cartridges each. So that's 18,000 rounds fired from just the 1st Pennsylvania Cavalry 
take that and multiply it by the other brigades along this line and by the Confederate defenders, Wickham's Virginia Brigade, and some South Carolinians in particular, fresh to Virginia, this was their first battle, and you get some sense of the violence of it. Unlike most cavalry battles, just a stand-up slugfest on either side of Enon Church. What proved to be the decisive moment came late in the day. Phil Sheridan had rode forward to see what all the noise was about and uh, was asked for reinforcements, and he threw forward George Custer's Michigan Brigade, the Wolverines of the 1st Cavalry Division, and you have the best view in the world right here of Custer's attack. Also dismounted on foot, two regiments in this field coming right toward you, right at the camera, the other two regiments on the other side of the road in what is today Woods, but also coming from east to west, and as they came up to the front line, the existing Union position, the worn out members of Gregg's division, they sort of folded open a gap, like opening up bat wing doors at a saloon or something, folded open a gap so that Custer's four regiments could move right on in, and with that momentum they just ran right over the Confederates on both sides of the Atlee Station Road, eventually forcing a crack in the Confederate line on both sides and inflicting pretty big losses. The losses I said earlier were about 700, about 350, 360 for each side, and so by that measurement at least it was a draw. The Confederates claimed they left on their own, of their own will, which wasn't exactly true, and certainly the Union troops kept possession of the battlefield, and so they could be considered victors, but from a, a loftier point of view, both sides had much to be proud of. Not only had they fought well, but Grant now had enough prisoners of war to know where Lee's line was, Lee had enough prisoners of war to know that the 2nd and the 6th and the 5th and the 9th Corps had crossed the Pamunkey and that Grant was over here and approaching from the south bank of the river. So both leaders, Grant and Lee, were satisfied with the day's work. And what they left behind was this beautiful Hawes Shop uh, battlefield. Uh, the bad news, a punchline, is that the entire field is about to be redeveloped, or de developed for the first time, I should say. Uh, several hundred acres. Um, completely altering this forever. I would say in the three decades almost that I've been around the battlefields at Richmond, this will be the biggest defeat we've suffered. We've gotten accustomed to winning. If you look at it impartially, you think back of all the things that have been accomplished, where we were, where we are now. It's a long series of victories. I would say this would be probably the biggest defeat we've suffered in at least the last 30 years. There's a lot of reasons for it. Uh, without going into all the details, I would say maybe in encapsulate it by saying that uh, you have to have a willing seller in order to preserve private property and that's one of the big uh, issues here that prevented this land from being preserved instead it's going to be covered with 10 acre lots and four or five hundred thousand dollar homes on each lot so this could be uh, your final view even your even though you're seeing it virtually of this part of the battlefield the good news the postscript is that the confederate side of the field behind enon church is still thickly wooded and still privately owned and there is at least some hope, not no immediate prospect, but hope of securing that for posterity and preserving it. Gary? Um, thanks, Bobby. And I wanted to just echo what he said about willing sellers. We have the best members in the world, but, uh, you know, we can't preserve something that somebody doesn't want to sell. Uh, it wasn't for lack of trying. Uh, Bobby, members of our staff went, you know, and really tried to make this happen, and it couldn't. So um, we will fight another day, um, and hopefully we'll be able to be more successful elsewhere with this battle. In the meantime, there is parking here. There's a great Civil War trail sign. There is a Confederate memorial because there's some burials here on site. So come check it out if you'd like, and I think we're going to pick up in a second closer to the Confederate position. All right, this is a brief stop just to sort of uh, wash out the bad taste of uh, the d development at Haw's shop and show that there is still a little bit of land that's preservable and intact. Uh, we're on a little bit of a ridge here, and this is the ridge defended by the Confederate cavalrymen, Wickham's Virginia Brigade for the most part. I'm standing, and so is the camera standing, in the Buckeye Road, which is a historic road. That way is north. You see Gary Edelman with his blue shirt way down there in the distance walking toward Buckeye, which is a historic house that still stands at the end of this road. And so this ridge, actually played a prominent role in the Confederates' tenacious defense. They only left it grudgingly at the very end of the day, but a tremendous number of the casualties, both Union and Confederate, happened in these woods, which are historic, on both sides of the Buckeye Road as they fought for possession of this high ground where we're standing. 
Enon Church, probably 200 yards to the right of the camera. 